Hi, everybody. Um, this is my first time at Force 11. Um, I'm only two years in working in journals, so this is all very new to me, and I'm learning quite a bit here, so much so that I feel like my presentation, if I could redo it right now, I would, but here I am, and so we'll do the best with what we have. I work with Springer Nature on the BMC side. I am a journal development manager. I um, manage a portfolio and a team who works across genetics, cell biology, so medical and life sciences. And so what I'm here to talk to you today about is open data badging. And I foolishly prepared a slide. Oops. Yeah, unlike the history of open data badging, and I'm fairly certain nobody in this room really needs a big refresher on this. But just in case, um, the Center for Open Science has created a badging system to promote open science behaviors. Um, one of these was an open data badge. It was uh, launched as a pilot study for the journal Psychological Science in 2000. And um, 14? Yes, 2014. And they found it was really effective. So researchers responded to this idea of a digital badge, rewarding their behavior for participating in an open science initiative. And as a result, um, researchers were claiming badges and saying and providing their data in an open way in a repository. They were saying it was complete, it was usable, all these great things. And the journal was getting a lot of open data shared. This is all good stuff. However, there was a little bit of a, a complication when Kidwell, who did the study in 2016, looking at the effectiveness of badging, when he looked into um, the authors who said the data was all there and all complete and all perfect, he found it wasn't quite the case. And to quote, it's possible that badging is sufficient to increase motivation to claim the behavior, but not sufficient to increase performing the behavior. Um, and so that's kind of where Springer Nature is wanting to take this forward. So while generally the open data badging started as like an honor system, the author would request, send in the disclosure statement and say, I, I should get a badge. Um, there is a peer review model that has been introduced that they're looking at too, but um, this is, would have to be done on, on the publisher side or the journal side. So that's really our goal, is we just want to come up with some kind of way to implement that for our journals, where we can actually validate that the, badge, that the uh, data is in an open repository, that it's available, and that readers can be reassured that when they see a badge on a paper, there's going to be data for them to go to that they can actually access. And so there's a lot of stuff here, but we really did essentially just want to work on coming up with a criteria that was going to be maybe a bit different from what the COS was using that would be applicable and achievable across all of the different disciplines of journals that Springer Nature publishes. Um, and we wanted to come up with a workflow that we could quickly and easily assess these papers for their eligibility for the badge. Obviously, we wanted to see if this was badging was going to continue to influence the behavior of authors for sharing the badges, but more to the point, we wanted to see if it influenced reader behavior with those papers and with the data. So this is a slide I would have removed, but basically this really speaks to the idea of all the things we had to consider coming up with this pilot, and as I'll speak in a few minutes more about, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's complicated. I think we hear that a lot in the talks that we have all these ideas that we think we can just do, and it ends up being a bit more complicated than you hope it would be. So there was a working group established with a bunch of people from across editorial, our research data support team, our policy teams, and we all kind of came together and kind of decided these are the key things we need to determine to take this forward. And I think the two key things on this list are what the badge criteria were going to be and how we were going to assess these papers. Um, and so we came up with answers to most of these questions and decided to go forward in the summer of 2018. So here's the criteria that was developed. And we did collaborate with the um, Center for Open Science in discussing kind of what were the key things to have included in the criteria. Um, and I think the top one is really the most important point is that there had to be a data availability statement, which is pretty much mandated for all of our publications anyhow, but it had to be a, a complete data availability statement that indicated that the data was available and that it was relevant to the paper. Um, so we would look at whether the data set or part of it, we weren't going to look if the complete data set was there, was actually where it said it would be in a repository, hopefully an appropriate one. And then um, the data set would have, that's better, 
the data set would have some kind of persistent object identifier so it was locatable and um, discoverable. So the proposed workflow was going to be similar to that of the peer review model for the um, COS badges and that it was for um, papers that were published already. So there was no opt-in. So authors were going to be notified via their um, submission system letters in their submission guidelines on the journal website. There was a little marketing campaign and told that all papers were going to be assessed for a badge. So basically, if they didn't really want one, they just didn't have to make their data available. Um, and our research data support team kindly actually volunteered to be the assessors. So they would be the ones looking at every data availability statement and determining the eligibility of each paper. So on this page, you can see what it kind of looked like. Um, so the, the open data badge here, right here, it would link to this below site here, which is the Badger platform, which is what we use for issuing the badges. So there, the criteria would be repeated, and the evidence from the paper saying it's relevant to the paper at hand, it has a DOI, um, the link to the data set, and the link back to the paper would all be provided there for any readers who wanted to see where the open data was and how to get to it. So our early assessment was really positive. We looked at three months before, three months after. There was an 11% increase in the number of papers that got badges. So 20% would have received badges, 31% were receiving badges. This is all good news, right? But as we started like really looking into it, we started thinking, do the authors even know? Because I don't think they do. Because authors, if they think they should be getting something, even if it's a digital badge and you're not hearing from them about it, and they, it seems a little strange, right? So we felt like we weren't getting any feedback from authors, so maybe they don't even know about this pilot. Um, we also discovered this journal publishes, we um, selected, I forgot that part, the journal BMC Microbiology, managed by an in-house editor, which made rollout a bit easier. It had a publishing volume that was going to be manageable for our RDS team. And it was broad scope. It publishes all kinds of papers across biology. Apparently, they also publish a whole lot of genetics papers. And genetics is a community that has a strong mandate for data sharing. And lastly, because we were interested in getting this badge kind of pilot rolled out, we couldn't get everything we had hoped for. And one of the things we couldn't get was a really good automated way of letting authors know they even got a badge. So most people were not being notified whether or not they got a badge. So we did a survey, asked the authors, did you know you got a badge? Did you know about the pilot? Um, the answer was no. They did not know about the pilot, and they did not know they got a badge. Only one person did. Um, on the upside, though, they were very supportive of the initiative. So it does give us some validation that this is something we need to do better and get right and, and figure out. Um, and more to the point, and more, the BMC microbiology editor was quite happy about this, um, knowing about the pilot made them more likely to resubmit to that journal. Um, and okay, and uh, so the authors also indicated what was valuable to them in terms of uh, why they would share their data. And interestingly, mandates was pretty low on the totem pole. So whether or not the genetics community mandate factored into this, it's hard to tell. Uh, but public benefit, visibility, impact, those were all the things that were meaningful to them. Why they didn't share their data primarily because they didn't know how or they didn't know where. And so I think as a publisher trying to pull up, uh, roll out an initiative like this, we do need to be more responsive to those needs and helping them navigate the way to share their data. We did look at reader engagement. We weren't able to look at the engagement with the actual um, data, but those papers that would had badges had a lot more views, a lot more clicks to download, had a much lower bounce rate. So that was really good news. They're getting a lot more people reading them. So these are the two slides I'll hopefully spend the last two minutes on. Um, and it, it's really just our, our lessons and takeaways and, and what we need to kind of figure out going forward if we're going to roll this out, which is we really need to improve the communication to the authors and really make sure they are fully aware of the pilot and what it means. Um, I think in speaking with colleagues in the London office and here, it's apparent that maybe post-publication isn't the best time for this. We might need earlier intervention um, before publication to see if we can help authors navigate that, um, that landscape of data sharing so that they're more willing to do it and more able to do it to get the badge. Um, and so we have done a few things, and we're just going to look at the data's not in for that yet, but we have changed the messaging a bit 
Um, we made it a lot more visible front and center. We've also put in a lot more about the resources that our data support team can provide. Um, but there's still a lot of things under discussion. Um, making the badged data, um, badged articles more visible is going to be a big thing because if we want to tell authors, you know, these badges can help increase the visibility and impact of their papers, we need to make the badges and the papers themselves more visible. So, um, yeah, these were a lot of our lessons learned and, and, and other challenges. So, it, just to speak through some of the other ones, um, the workflow is very manual at the moment. To, so, to scale this up, we'd really need some automated options for assessing certain parts of the data availability statement and automating communication and um, increasing visibility, uh, linking to the data set so we can maybe track engagement with the data sets and the papers. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to we have a lot to figure out still to scale this out more widely. Um, but I think it's something worth doing because it is clearly something authors are feeling more and more strongly about and they want to do. Um, and we want to be able to help them do that and get a badge to show that they did. So that's basically my talk. Um, there's a lot of people who helped make this possible. But I think I'm in a group of people who are well positioned to provide some insights into how we might take this forward. So any questions for Rebecca? It's on apparently. Oh, there it is. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just interested in the in the the um, images you showed uh, about there being an intent. You know, uh, authors positively responding, saying they were more likely to submit to the journal because of open badging. Did you see that borne out in their actual behaviour? I'm just trying to sort of distinguish between sort of virtue signalling and actual behaviour. Right. So when we did this survey, this. I don't, I would have to go back and look more closely at the data, whether or not the people who answered that question with a yes, I'd be more likely even received a data badge on their paper. But these were past submissions. So these weren't future submissions. So we'd have to go back and see if those authors have since submitted. And, but it's only been a couple of months. So that's unlikely we'll see anything right away. That Great. would bear that out. Thank you. Absolutely. There was someone here. Is there someone over there? Yeah. Hi, Stuart Taylor from the Royal Society. Um, is it not preferable to just mandate that open data is requ required for all articles, then you don't need the badges? Because on our journals, we make it a requirement. So that means that the authors have to publish a data availability statement, and they also have to provide a link to their data in the reference list. So then right. everybody has to do it, and if they don't, we reject the article. No, that's a very good point, and I think that it would be the ideal world. Um, I, I think there, the challenge in that is what we were trying to do was actually like validate it, and, and with the scope of how many publications we have, that's kind of a hard thing for everyone to, at publication, double-click through the links and make sure that everything's where it says it's going to be and that the uh, numbers are right. Sometimes we were encountering authors that were, they only made those links live once the thing published. It wouldn't go live beforehand. Um, I, I think you're right, yes. It would be great if it was just mandated and it didn't get accepted. Um, but I think there's just situations where authors don't know what, how to share that data or they don't feel comfortable sharing the data and we need to address those issues to get them there as well. I, I don't know if that's a good answer to your question or not. I'm sorry. I think we've got to move on. Oh. I encourage you to track down Rebecca in the coffee as soon as she's okay answering questions over.